Okay, so we're going to look at chapter seven's photosynthesis and make sure you have your outline um, in front of you. We are going to start with the leaf structure. So this is um, a leaf, as you can see here, and the leaves of plants will always have a cuticle on the top of the leaf. So if you go outside, you'll notice that the top of a leaf and the bottom of the leaf are going to be slightly different. The top of the leaf is going to be shiny. It's going to be um, maybe a different color than the bottom of the leaf. The bottom of the leaf tends to be dull and a different color green. But this is because the shininess is because there's a wax called the cuticle on the top of the leaf. And this is to reduce the amount of water it, lose, it loses because the top of the leaf is what's exposed to the sun. It gets super, super hot and water is likely to evaporate from the leaf, right? So if it's really hot, it's going to take the water out of the leaf. So this wax called the cuticle is made to protect the leaf from losing water. Now the bottom of the leaf doesn't have that because what the leaf needs to do is to exchange gases. So the bottom of the leaf does not have wax because it needs to be open and porous to exchange gases with the environment. So in a way, plants breathe the way that we breathe, they exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide with the environment just like we do. And they do this from the bottom of the leaf and there are tiny little um, pores, uh, letter B, um, the bottom of the leaf. So if you look at this picture here, we can see that we are exchanging gases. There's carbon dioxide going into the leaf, oxygen's leaving the leaf, and this little guy here that's cut in half and this little guy here, that's our pore. So that's called a stomate. Stomates are pores of the leaf and the plants can actually control um, whether their pores are open or closed. So on a really hot day, if a plant's going to be in danger of losing too much water, it'll close the pores so that water won't evaporate from the bottom of the leaf. And if it's cooler, it will open the pores so that you can, or the plant can exchange gases. So the word guard cells, letter B, are the cells that actually make the pores up. So they look kind of like um, almost like a fat letter C, a lima bean kind of. So those, this is a guard cell. Okay, and they're, so they're both guard cells and then that pore in the middle, right, that's open space. That's the place where CO2 and oxygen gas can be exchanged. All right, so that's the anatomy of a leaf. Um, now inside the body of the leaf, right, we're gonna have cells. And what you see here is a cell. So this entire uh, structure is a plant cell. And inside the plant cell, we can see a smaller, greener unit. One, two, we have lots of them, right? You can see lots and lots of green units. Those are the chloroplasts. You can actually see chloroplasts with your eyes if you had a microscope. So these are visible to the eye if you magnify it with a light microscope. This, of course, is our diagram of a chloroplast, and this is where photosynthesis takes place. So just to review the structure of a chloroplast, remember the chloroplast is a double membrane structure. So we have an outer membrane, we have an inner membrane that we can see here. Inside of the chloroplast, we have these green discs. So each green disc that you see here is called a thylakoid membrane, and they are stacked and the stacks, each one of these stacked units is called a granum, okay? You might see the word grana, but this is plural. So that's when you have many granum. All right, so that's our chloroplast. Oh, and then lastly, the word stroma. So the interior, so what is this, the, the thick liquid kind of viscous stuff that you would find all in between the thylakoids? That would be the stroma, okay? All right, so um, let's move on to, uh, so here again, this is a nicer, bigger picture of a chloroplast, all right? And the question here is, what advantage comes from stacking these thylakoid membranes? Why do you wanna stack them together like this? 
And the answer is to fit as many as we can inside of each chloroplast. Okay, so we're trying to maximize, maximize the number of phylicoids membrane, I'm just gonna put thylakoids, inside the chloroplast. Okay, why? Because the thylakoid membranes, these thylakoids, is where photosynthesis happens. So the more membranes you pack into a chloroplast, the more photosynthesis that could happen, and the more efficient the, the plant can be by converting the sunlight energy into chemical energy. All right. Let's move on. Um, so before we talk about the photosynthesis reaction, um, we're gonna talk about uh, the next topic here, endergonic versus exergonic reactions. So you just wanna be avail uh, aware of the word endergonic and exergonic as um, a reaction that requires energy or releases energy. So you see the word endergonic requires energy from the environment and then exergonic reactions releases energy to the environment. So I'm going to ask you about photosynthesis here. So let's fill in the blanks with our photosynthesis overview. So since you are familiar with cellular respiration, we went over that, this is just the flip of cellular respiration. So what do plants need in order to grow? they're going to need carbon dioxide from the environment, right? Carbon dioxide from the air. Then you also need to water your plants, right? We need to add water. And then this is energy, and this is energy from the sun, right? So this is solar energy, sunlight energy. That energy comes into the reactions of photosynthesis, so we're sucking in the energy from the environment. So what do you think this categorizes a photosynthesis as an endergonic or exergonic reaction. So hopefully you are thinking to yourself it's endergonic because it's harnessing the energy from the outside, right? It's taking sunlight in, requiring it for the, for the chemical reactions. The products are going to be glucose. And we have our oxygen. Ooh, the red doesn't show up on red, right? Oxygen. Um, waste product. All right, so we're going to look at how does a plant um, convert the carbon dioxide and water in using the sun energy to a sugar molecule or organic molecule. So remember these reactants are inorganic, okay, reactants, and we are producing an organic product. So that's why we're calling these organisms that do autotrophs that can photosynthesize, they're calling producers because they're producing an organic product for the rest of the other organisms that cannot photosynthesize so they can eat that. Um, in this area in your outline, I also go over again um, autotroph versus heterotroph. This is a slightly different slide than the other one, um, but it's the same, right? Autotrophs in general make their own food and by the term by what i mean by make their own food is food is organic molecules okay and heterotrophs can't they have to obtain this from the outside by eating it right so what are some organisms that are considered autotrophs out there you probably already know plants but there are some protists like algae is actually considered a protist that can photosynthesize seaweed is also in this category and there are some bacteria that can do that as well and then what are heterotrophs right so these are all animals fungi so mold and mushrooms they actually dissolve and digest the um, things that they're growing on so they actually have to eat also and then some bacteria are going to be heterotrophs all right, so before talking about photosynthesis um, specifically, let's just familiarize yourself with light. What is light and what are pigments? So light is a form of electromagnetic energy. So you can see that this, everything you see here in this chart is a form of electromagnetic energy. So gamma rays, x-rays, UV rays, infrared, microwaves, radio waves, these are all forms of the same kind of energy. What's the difference between them is how long their wavelengths are. So this 
up here is how long each wavelength is for each energy type. So let's look at wavelengths. A wavelength is, um, so these forms of energy, the energy travels in waves and you measure the length of a wave either from peak to peak or you can measure it from trough, which is the bottom, to the, to the trough of the next one. It doesn't matter where you measure, but it, that's one wavelength. And so wavelength actually has um, an actual unit. You can measure these. So if you look at the um, wavelengths at the top, right, we have 10 to the negative fifths nanometers here at gamma rays. So gamma rays, these are very, very small, smallest end of the spectrum. And then we come all the way to the other side where we have 10 to the third meters with radio waves. That is very, very long wavelengths, right? 10 to the third meters is a kilometer. So these are really long waves. And then everything in between. So visible light, the light that you can see with your eyes, right? This is what we've evolved to be able to um, detect. This is also just different wavelengths. And so the different colors that you see are different wavelengths of light. So if you look at this, right, purple is 380 nanometers. That's the unit we're working with here. N is for nano. And then 750 is red on the other end of the spectrum, 750 nanometers. So let me ask you, which color it has the longest wavelength? And that would be red, right? So there's an energy associated with wavelengths. It turns out that the longer the wavelength, the lower the energy. So radio waves, for example, these have very low energy. Radio waves are around us all the time. Um, the reason why you can turn on the stereo and hear a radio station is because those waves are traveling through the atmosphere and your radio can pick them up. It doesn't hurt our bodies for the radio waves to be around us because they're so weak, they can't penetrate or harm us penetrate into our cells or, or harm any molecules in our body. However, on the other end of the spectrum for gamma rays, these are very short wavelengths. So um, these would be like tiny, tiny, you know, wavelengths like this. This actually has a high amount of energy. The shorter the wavelengths, the higher the energy, the lower the, sorry, the longer the wavelengths, the lower the energy. Why are these so dangerous? Why is it that it's unhealthy to get a lot of x-rays or it's unhealthy to stay out in the sun too long because UV rays are damaging, right? They're dangerous for us. They can cause cancer. It's because they have such high energy that they can penetrate through our cells into our, um, into our body and into our cells and that energy can actually knock around some molecules and destroy the structure of molecules and for UV, uh, cancer is when you destroy or you make little um, problems in DNA. So I want to say problems, mutations in DNA. Um, you can break the DNA double bond. So UV, a long exposure to UV, like if you go out to the beach on a very sunny day, um, you can get sunburn and skin damage because that UV radiation can actually physically damage your, your cells and your DNA. So the same thing with x-rays. You don't want to get too many x-rays a year and pregnant women cannot get x-rays because those rays are very powerful. They can go into your skin, your, your um, DNA. They can damage your DNA. So specifically for pregnant women, right, you never want to go through an x-ray machine because you can damage the fetus, the fetal DNA. Um, and any small little damage when you're just developing as a fetus is, can be very, very dangerous. All right, so that's just that. So in terms of um, energy here, right, so what would you say purple is? Is purple a high energy, in, in terms of just looking at colors, is this a high energy color or a low energy color? Having 380 nanometer wavelength compared to everything else. So hopefully you said this is a high energy color, right, because it has a shorter wavelength. Red is the lowest uh, or the longest wavelength and the lowest energy, okay? So Hopefully what you know now is that different colors that you see are just different wavelengths of energy. They have different wavelengths. And visible light, so if you look at this prism over here, when you see sunlight, 
sunlight has all of these different wavelengths of energy in it, it just comes to our eyes as being white. So in all the rays, when all the different energies hit your eye, it's white to us. But you can actually split it with a prism, right? And then that will split all the different wavelengths so that they could travel differently. Um, and then you see the rainbow. So it's pretty cool. So let's get back to, um, to light and pigments. So um, we talked about number one, number two, and number three, okay, in the um, outline. I asked you to draw a wavelength, which hopefully you did here. And now let's talk about pigments. So pigments are really important um, molecules, not only in nature, but you know we, we paint with pigments. And anything that has a color in the world is because of a pigment molecule. So for photosynthesis, we really are going to look at chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a green pigment. It's an organic molecule, so you can see the structure of chlorophyll. And what chlorophyll does is it, it absorbs certain wavelengths of light and then reflects green. And so the reason why we see um, chlorophyll as being green is because it absorbs, let me go back to the picture here, okay? chlorophyll, that pigment molecule, will actually take in all of the wavelengths here. It takes in the blue-violet range. It'll also take in or, or absorb the red-orange range, but it doesn't like to absorb this middle range and it reflects that. So that reflection hits our eye and that's why we see chlorophyll as green because it's the only wavelength it does not absorb. It reflects it. Okay, so all the sunlight coming in to a chlorophyll pigment, all the colors get absorbed. So the energy gets kind of absorbed in that chlorophyll. But the only one that doesn't, it bounces away, is the green color, the green wavelength. This little guy is the symbol for wavelength. So that's why we see green. Our eye, this is not going to be good, you guys, <laughs> but here's our eye right? Our eye picks up on the wavelength coming into it and we see green. So I want to show you chlorophyll's absorption spectrum here. So this is the different colors, right? We have purple, our blues, reds, yellows. So this is, there's different kinds of chlorophyll. There's chlorophyll A, there's chlorophyll B, and there's another pigment um, we'll talk about called carotenoids, okay? Chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B are green, um, because they reflect green. So this is this graph is the amount of light absorbed. So this the higher the line here, the more of that color is being absorbed. So let's look at chlorophyll A. Chlorophyll A absorbs here and here, big high peaks, right? And also absorbs here. So what is it taking in? It's taking in the bluish purple. It's also taking in the red. But what is it not taking in? Look how it flatlines right here right? There's a lot of flat area. That's the color it reflects. All right, so mainly in the green area. Chlorophyll B, same thing. Carotenoids, slightly different. The carotenoids are going to absorb uh, a little bit of the green. See, it has a high peak here. It's actually absorbing in the green area. But carotenoids are orangey yellow, so it does not absorb anything in the orangey yellow and reflects that, and that's why we see the pigment called carotenoid is an orangey yellow pigment and actually carrots is perfect because carrots are very rich in this pigment. That's maybe uh, uh, why it's called carotenoid, but um, that's why we see carrots as orange um, because they have, they're very, very rich in that pigment. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. So the overall idea is that every color you see in the world, it's because of pigments. There's all different kinds of pigments out there. When you buy paint, it's the, the pigments in the paint is what makes the color. Pigments absorb different energies in that light um, spectrum. The only energy it does not absorb or any energies that it does not absorb, it will reflect and that reflection will hit your eye and that's what color you see, okay. Now, green chlorophyll is predominant in plants, right? When you think about leaves, they're all green. However, 
There are also these accessory pigments in the leaf. There are yellow and red and purple. There are all different kinds of pigments out there. The reason why you don't see um, in these leaves, these leaves, if it's not fall or if it's spring, these are usually green. But why are they green? Because there's so much chlorophyll in the growing season when the tree is growing that it covers up these accessory pigments. Um, when the fall comes and these certain deciduous trees are going to lose their leaves, they go dormant, then the tree goes, well, I'm not going to make any more chlorophyll. I'm not going to use chlorophyll. So the chlorophyll production goes away. And then what's left over is you see all these accessory pigments left in the leaf. Okay. So accessory pigments is in your outline. There is chlor xanthophyll, which is yellow, carotenoids, which is our oranges, and then anthocyanins, which are blue. Okay. And these are the same things that are in like blueberries. So blueberries are really rich in anthocyanins. Carotenoids are very rich in your orange fruits and vegetables. Um, these uh, accessory pigments, they're good for us be uh, because they actually act as antioxidants. So when you eat vegetables and fruits of different colors, you're actually also eating those pigments and those pigments can actually help as um, antioxidants. So they help you, um, your cells be a little healthier. All right. So in terms of chlorophyll, chlorophyll A is the main pigment of photosynthesis. All right. So we're going to pause the here and then move on to part two for photosynthesis.